Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on calcium signalling, in which we are going to talk about calcium sparklets, calcium sparks, and calcium scraps. Okay, uh, so um, these are all terms which refer to um, calcium signals that occur in cardiomyocytes. So, let's say we have a cardiomyocyte here. Okay, and let's say this is a T-tubule or a transverse tubule in that cardiomyocyte. So, this is our cardiomyocyte here. Um, let me bring this out a bit. Right, so bring this down. And there's our complete cardiomyocyte now. So, this is a cardiomyocyte. Okay, and uh, this indentation into the cardiomyocyte, that is a T or transverse tubule. Right, okay. So, um, what happens is when the action potential propagates down the membrane into the T tubule, there are a certain type of voltage gated calcium channel in the membrane here. And this type of voltage-gated calcium channel is known as an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. So I'll label it here. This is an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And I will explain exactly what it means to be an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, they also have another name, basically. Um, an older name. Uh, they are also sometimes referred to as dihydro pyridine receptors. So they're also called dihydropyridine receptors. And you will still sometimes see uh, that name uh, used for these channels. Um, okay, so you would abbreviate L-type voltage-gated calcium channel to L-type VGCC for voltage-gated calcium channel. And you would abbreviate dihydropyridine receptor just to DHPR, basically. Right, okay, so let's draw this receptor in a bit more detail uh, down here, basically. Let's say this is the phospholipid bile there, here, and uh, this receptor basically sits in the phospholipid bile there, and the pore-forming subunit, which is known as the alpha-1 subunit, is often divided into four separate domains. Okay, so I will show this divided into four domains. Domain 1, which I would say is this one here. Domain 2 over there. Domain 3 over here. And domain 4 here. Okay? And um, what this, um, what this uh, alpha-1 subunit is, is it is a single polypeptide. So it's made up of only one polypeptide. So these domains are not separate polypeptides. It's one polypeptide that makes up all four domains, but uh, these domains are sort of units of repeat. So all four of these domains are pretty much very similar structure. So uh, that's why they're separated into these four domains, because they're really uh, the four portions of the polypeptide which make the pore. And this is known as the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay? Now, if your uh, voltage-gated calcium channel is of the L-type, which this is, it's an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, then it means that this alpha-1 subunit needs to be encoded by a certain gene. So basically, um, there are absolutely loads of genes which encode for alpha-1 subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels, and they can be subdivided into uh, three major families like so. So there is the uh, CAV1 family, which stands for voltage-gated calcium channel first family. Then there is the CAV2 family, the voltage-gated calcium channel family 2. And then the CAV3 family, the voltage-gated calcium channel family 3. Now, this first family is the family that we are interested in uh, for L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. And it has four different genes that are all within this family. CAV1.1, CAV1.2, CAV1.3, and CAV1.4, which are four genes which are all counted as being in this CAV1 um, one family of genes, basically. So, 
If you are an L-type voltage gated calcium channel, it means that your alpha-1 subunit is encoded for by a gene in this CAV1 family, i.e. it's encoded for by one of these four um, genes, CAV1.1 through CAV1.4. Right, so that is what it means to be an L-type voltage gated calcium channel, basically, VGCC. Okay, so, um, right, so that's the alpha-1 subunit of the voltage gated calcium channel. Now, voltage gated calcium channels usually have a bunch of auxiliary subunits alongside. So the alpha-1 subunit is the main pore forming subunit, but there are a bunch of other subunits that attach on and moderate the function of it. So, for instance, here is the gamma, uh, gamma subunit, the beta subunit lurks down there somewhere, and then the alpha-2 delta subunit sticks over here. So this is alpha-2 delta. Right, okay. So, you have these L-type voltage-gated calcium channels in the membrane of your T-tubule here. Now, when the action potential occurs, the membrane potential across this portion of uh, the cell membrane becomes depolarized, which means that um, uh, the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular becomes less negative. That change is detected by the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, and it causes it to open, basically. So this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel opens, and when it does so, it conducts calcium ions. Now, calcium is much higher extracellularly than it is intracellularly. We know these figures by now. Calcium concentration intracellularly is around 100 nanomolar, very low, and calcium concentration extracellularly is around 1.5 millimolar. Okay, so there is a huge concentration uh, gradient that is favoring calcium movement into the cell. Okay, Factor in also the fact that the electrical potential difference across this membrane may also be negative, because in the upstroke of the action potential, uh, the voltage-gated calcium channels uh, get activated, um, and uh, they it, yes, okay, in the action potential you do go to positive electrical potentials eventually, generally to up to around plus 20 millivolts, but for the most part, you are either neutral or maybe even negative. So there may well even be an electrical driving force um, driving the calcium uh, movement into the cell. Regardless, you get an, a little movement of calcium from the extracellular compartment into the intracellular compartment through this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, this little sort of rising calcium that you get around this L-type calcium channel, that rising calcium is what is known as a calcium sparklet, okay? So, the rising calcium around an L-type voltage-gated calcium channel is what is known as a calcium sparklet. Okay, now we know what the function of this calcium sparklet is. It does not, repeat, it does not cause contraction of the cardiomyocyte. It is not large enough to cause contraction of the cardiomyocyte. It, it's important, but it's not that important. It's not, uh, well, it's, it is very, very important, uh, but it's not the thing that can claim responsibility for why the cardiomyocyte is contracting. Instead, its role is to cause uh, a release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum or sarcoplasmic reticulum because we're dealing with uh, a muscle cell, uh, which will then be a much larger rise in calcium that will cause the contraction of the muscle. So basically, in this um, sarcoplasmic reticular membrane, there is a channel known as the rhianodine type 2 receptor, or the type 2 rhianodine receptor is probably a nicer way of saying it. Type 2 rhianodine receptor. Rhianodine receptor. Okay, and we'll... Um, look at this receptor in a bit more detail below, but it's also often denoted its shorthand, RY for ryanodine, R for receptor, and then 2 to denote that it's the type 2 ryanodine receptor. Okay, so let's have a look at this um, ryanodine receptor type 2 in a type 2 ryanodine receptor in a bit more detail. So basically, the type 2 ryanodine receptor is a massive great receptor, absolutely massive great protein. 
it is made up of four proteins, in fact, four polypeptides that all come together to make it. Okay, so I'll divide it up into four pieces, but in this case, it really is made up of four polypeptides. Okay, so in each one of these um, sockets, you put a separate subunit, and all of them are absolutely identical. They are all encoded by the type 2 ryanodine receptor gene. So all of the four proteins that come together to make this ryanodine receptor are of the same type. They are identical in amino acid uh, composition, basically. They're encoded by the same gene. So the ryanodine receptor is basically what is known as a homotetramer. It's a compulsive homotetramer, unlike the IP3 receptors. Okay, now these proteins that make up the ryanodine receptor, they are absolutely massive proteins. Around 5,000 amino acids long. That is a big protein. So you have got four of those coming together to make this overall type 2 ryanodine receptor. So it is a massive, great receptor. Okay, now basically, this is in the membrane of your sarcoplasmic reticulum. When the calcium spark that occurs, when this calcium rises in the vicinity of uh, the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, that calcium causes uh, the activation of the type 2 ryanodine receptor in what is known as calcium-induced calcium release. So this is calcium-induced calcium release, KIKR for short. Uh, so let me just write out what that means. KIKR, calcium-induced calcium release. So calcium induced calcium release and it's an acronym that you will see a lot basically calcium induced calcium release okay right so the calcium from the um, extracellular fluid that was let in through this L-type voltage-gated calcium channel comes and activates uh, the type 2 ryanodine receptor and that causes the type 2 ryanodine receptor to open and calcium moves from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytosol. So you get a rise in cytosolic calcium. That rise in cytosolic calcium around the type 2 ryanodine receptor is what is known as a calcium spark, basically. Okay, so we've had calcium sparklets and calcium sparks now. All I need to tell you is what is a calcium scrap. Well, basically, uh, on the cytosolic side of the type 2 ryanodine receptor, you are going to get calcium rising. But on the luminal, the SR lumen side of the SR of the uh, ryanodine receptor type 2, you are going to get calcium falling. And the falling calcium on the luminal side of the type 2 ryanodine receptor is what is known as a calcium scrap. So basically, you will notice that it's basically calcium spark with these four letters here spelt backwards. So spark and then scrap. So that's where that uh, name comes from. So the calcium scrap is basically the reduction in calcium uh, level around uh, the uh, ryanodine receptor type 2 uh, that you see when the uh, calcium is left through the ryanodine receptor into uh, the cytosol to cause a calcium spark here. And you might wonder, well, why have people named these things? Well, it's because when you uh, use uh, calcium sensors to visualize calcium concentration, you see a rise in calcium here that will be uh, represented by uh, some sort of potentially a fluorescent uh, change, a change in fluorescence, so you'll be able to visualize it. Uh, and you'll see a, the opposite change here, so you can visualize these changes in calcium concentration, and that's why people came to neighbor, uh, name them. So, revision. A calcium spark that is the rise in calcium around the L-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And the calcium spark that um, is involved in calcium-induced calcium release on the type 2 ryanodine receptor, which leads to calcium leaving the SR and elevating around the type 2 ryanodine receptor. That elevation around the type 2 ryanodine receptor is known as a calcium spark. The converse, which is the reduction in calcium around the luminal side of the type 2 ryanodine receptor, is then called a calcium scrap. The calcium sparks from the type 2 ryanodine receptors sum up to cause, um, to cause a calcium level that rises in the whole cardiomyocyte and causes contraction of that cardiomyocyte.